what really struck me in this conference was how similar certain of the issues broached and also the, the tensions revealed were to debates that have taken place within the context of poverty over the last 15 years or so. And so given, as Winston said, that most of my work focuses on poverty, I, I'd like to use it as a lens with which uh, to view some of the issues that have come up here and um, perhaps forge some linkages between some of the silos that were referred to in the opening plenary. So more specifically, I'd like to talk about three things, and they are multidisciplinarity, or sorry, multidimensionality, stocks and flows, and lastly, the thorny issue of causation. So first, multidimensionality. For, for a long time, you know, it's been recognized that poverty is not simply about lack of purchasing power proxied by income or consumption. And there are many, many dimensions of deprivation, you know, that are widely recognized. Things like inadequate health, education, personal insecurity, lack of dignity, and so forth. Um, in the last 15 years or so, this has really been thrust into the poverty literature, and there's been a spate of work on multidimensional poverty indices, multidimensional poverty analysis, including a lot of work done here at WIDER. And, you know, I see this reflected in the conference where, if I can just go through one by one, we have separate sessions on hunger, personal insecurity via conflict, vulnerability, education, health, water, and gender violence. And, you know, the elimination of all this stuff may have instrumental value insofar as it brings about other things which we deem to be worthwhile, but it's also of intrinsic importance. And, you know, this may be just restating the obvious, but I think it's worth repeating. Okay, so that was my first point with respect to multidimensionality. Now, now I'd like to say something about this distinction between stocks and flows. And within the poverty literature, a core distinction of late is between the analysis of poverty status or the stocks of poverty on the one hand and analysis of poverty dynamics or the flows of poverty on the other. And for me, I think it has some cutting power here because it maps quite closely on a distinction that was brought up in uh, the plenary by Tony and uh, Raquel. And this is a distinction, and I'm gonna read, between continuing crises of poverty, hunger, and disease, on the one hand, and unexpected crises due to wars, natural disasters, pandemic, and economic shocks. So, so let me just do a little unpacking here and then get to why I think this matters. Okay, so the, the unpacking is this. You know, in typically, until relatively recently, when we've had a lot more panel data, the um, typical form of poverty analysis looked at stocks of poverty. So stocks of poverty at one point in time or at multiple points in time. So you could say something useful, say, about magnitude, so poverty percentages or numbers, you might be able to say something about trends, characteristics, and you know, if you're lucky, causes. Okay, poverty dynamics is different. It does different things. What it does is it tracks individuals or households over time. So in the end, you can say something about four different categories of persons, namely, those who stay poor, 
those who exit, who escape, those who fall into poverty, and those who are never poor. Now, within this literature, emphasis tends to be placed on those who fall into poverty or who are at risk of falling into poverty. And this is the whole language of vulnerability. So the, under, the associated concept of ill-being or deprivation changes. Here we're worried about vulnerability, downside risk, the likelihood of a descent into poverty. Typically, the triggers of such descents, this gets us into the whole languages of shocks, of hazards. In, in the poverty literature, there are six that are deemed to be the most important for populations in the global south. And I'm just going to read them off, and you're going to see that every single one of them has been covered in this conference. So the six biggies are conflict, illness, natural disaster, harvest failure, terms of trade deterioration, loss of employment. And so one by one, you know, I actually systematically did it, and everything has been covered here. Now, whether or not these shocks actually lead to descents, to worsening of living condition, depends on a number of things. Depends on their severity, their frequency, their bunchiness, if they all come right after each other. It depends on exposure of populations. And it also depends on response, so-called coping strategies, strategies of adaptation, some of this falls under the heading of resilience. OK, so by and large, the analysis of poverty is very different now than it was, say, 20 years ago. The language has, ter has changed. The terms have changed. The analysis ha has changed. OK, but so, so what, right? D does any of this actually matter for any practical purposes? And I think it does matter big time, and I think it matters for at least two reasons. And the first reason is that, like, we're talking about big, a big time phenomena. The, the magnitude of transitory poverty can be very, very large. And so if you define transitory poverty as those who sometimes are poor and then at other times in different spells are not poor, and if you look at many spells, if you go from one to two to three to four, you see that sometimes the transitory component of poverty is two, three, four, five, six times as large as the chronic component. So there's a lot more people moving in and out than was previously thought. Now, two caveats here, so I don't overstate this point, is one, this is part of this is driven by measurement error. And two, this doesn't necessarily generalize to all dimensions of deprivation. And I learned in the session in nutrition yesterday that the chronic component of malnutrition is more important by a large um, order of magnitude than the transitory part associated with recent crises. But nevertheless, transitory poverty is a very big deal. OK, and then secondly, the other reason why this matters is um, because the policy response can be systematically different. So the kinds of things we have in mind to address long-term chronic poverty can and are very different from the sort of things that we have in mind to foresaw dissents. And so the latter often fall under the heading of things like um, social protection measures, insurance schemes, diversification of sources of income at a more macro level, capital controls in the context of currency crises, and things like this. And, you know, the, the a session I attended on responding to economic shocks I thought was very good in teasing out a number of these appropriate policy responses. Okay, so. They matter because it's a big-time phenomena, and two, policy responses tend to be different. 
So let me just make three points about future challenges. I, you know, it said to say something about future challenges. So three come to mind with respect to the distinction between stocks, flows, dynamics, status, transitory, chronic. And here are the three. Um, you know, I've never really seen a good analysis where you've weighed both pros and cons of strategies to affect transitory versus chronic poverty. And in the real world, there is a finite pie, so investments in one may very well be at the expense of the other. So I think that's one challenge, to do something like that. Secondly, and obviously, it's the win-win stuff that, of course, is uh, what everyone's looking for. And the paradigm case is health. A good, efficient, functioning <coughs> health system tends to be very good for both transitory and chronic poverty. There are other things like that. And lastly, there's, a, there's an older literature that came up, I've heard at the conference, and it's another way of saying the same thing. And this is a literature on linking relief and development. So, you know, doing things in the immediate to address, you know, real human suffering, but at the same time, doing it with a view towards long-term um, uh, effects. And given that many of the world's crises are unlikely to be of short duration, you know, I, I think this is an important point. Okay, so, so much for stocks and flows. Let me conclude with my, my third point. And, and this is a causation thing. And, you know, as we all know, causation is really complex. And it's complex because there's a ton of things going on, and they're all going on at the same time. So it's hard to know what exactly is driving what. And it's in, particularly hard empirically to demonstrate this. Um, and in the literature on poverty, there's many, many ways to try and, you know, make causal claims and to impose a causal structure on it. But there's one distinction which, once again, I find useful. I find it has cutting power for this conference. And I found this came up, like, again and again and again in sessions that I attended. Okay. And um, the distinction is, um, is as follows. And... In, in this discussion, I'm referring mainly to income poverty, but you can generalize with appropriate modifications to other dimensions of deprivation. But here's the distinction. So on the one hand, one causal approach to poverty, which is very widespread, and I think it tends to be the model which underlies a lot of aid or development assistance, is the view that poverty is caused by a lack or a want of sources of income or consumption growth. And the implicit idea here is that of a production function, where on the left-hand side, the end game is some measure of output or income. And then on the right-hand side are all the determinants of this. So you can have things like you know, your factors of production, land, labor, physical capital, can have human capital, tech, technology, technological change, have credit, and things like that. And essentially, poverty or low income is due to low levels of these things. So in terms of poverty reduction strategies and affecting poverty reduction, the key is to increase things like health or education or to invest in rural infrastructure, to um, think about technological change in agriculture to increase yields, and that kind of stuff with a view to increase incomes. So that's one view, and I've, I heard it in a number of conferences, and, you know, it's, it's a sensible way to think about the causation of poverty in the context of, in particular, development assistance and for some purposes. Okay, but I also heard a very different take on what causes poverty here at, at this conference, and this comes out very prominently in the literature. And this is going structural. And so you're looking at more systemic roots of present day poverty. Um, and so attention shifts from, you know, correlates of the poor to aspects of some kind of system, be it the world economic system, the trade regime, the food system, or national level structures or subnational structures. Um, and, you know, if, if, you, if you scratch structure a little bit, you're talking about power. 
and the exercise of power, and you know, be it political, economic, military, gender-based, or what have you. And really, this is the world of political economy. So when you're looking at present-day outcomes like poverty or whatever, you know, the immediate question that comes to mind is who benefits and in whose interest do these things serve? And so, you know, this is, the, this is what I heard in multiple sessions. And it came out um, in discussion of uh, the global of reform, of the global economic system, reform of trade, question of political economy of food insecurity, looks like questions of agenda set, who's making decisions, what issues are on and off the table, and so on. Okay, and you know, obviously the relevance of this is because, you know, where you look causally when you, is where you want to go with respect to remedies, um, you know, things that you think should be done. So in terms of challenges or future challenges, I just have two points to make here. And um, the first point is that, um, you know, structural change is a lot harder to affect and it's inherently political. So, you know, you have this tension, but it, on the other hand, if it works, it's more far reaching. So you got a tension between effectiveness on the one hand and uh, reach on the other. I don't know how you mediate that, but I just throw it on the table. And then um, secondly, you know, is the role of development assistance in this, in this context. And, you know, I'm, like, I'm convinced by Finn's type of analysis that development assistance can work, but is it confined to incremental as opposed to more transformational change? So these are just some issues which seem to me to be relevant. Okay, I, I think I've talked for too long and I'm sorry about that. So basically I said three things. I said multidimensionality, stocks and flows, causation, structure versus uh, production function. That's how I see some of these things hanging together and that's my attempt to de-silo uh, some of these disparate issues. Thank you.